I, we saw a great drummer who we were excited about playing a sh seeing play a show, a local show, um, with this like singer songwriter group. He opened the show with a drum solo, <laughs> then played like a drum solo in the first song, and then like at the end of the hit played like another drum solo. So I quickly learned not to do that in certain settings. <laughs> so. You're listening to the Free of Free of Free of Free of Music podcast. To the Free of Music podcast. Hey, yeah, my name's Gator, uh, Gator Petropolis, and I play uh, drums for Pigeons Playing Ping Pong. You've been with the band now six years, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Before I was able, you know, fortunate enough to, to join these guys, you know, I'd played local shows and everything, but, you know, I really hadn't played on that professional level like that. So, you know, as the band progressed and, you know, every every show kind of became a highlight. You know, I can remember my first festival with them, Aura Festival, um, in Suwannee Park down in Florida, and I can remember pacing back behind the behind the stage, just like freaking out, and you know that was like a first you know memorable milestone, and you know we you know we've been blessed and fortunate to keep growing, so you know it grew to you know other events, and you know we've been able to you know Red Rocks, you know playing a venue like Red Rocks or you know Bonnaroo Fest or Lockin Fest. It, you know, as we progress and are able to, you know, to do that, it, it, highlights just kind of keep coming. There's more and more kind of rewards. So, in general, highlights, you know, Red Rocks always comes comes to play. Um, like I said, Bonnaroo, some of the bigger festivals, summer camp. But honestly, bef you know, like I said, before Pigeons, there, I hadn't done much traveling either. So just the, you know, entire experience and everything that comes along with it has been a major highlight, ongoing highlight. Let's go back through your personal, uh, you know, history a little bit, not not to get to uh, dive into too many weeds, but uh, just yeah. want to focus on the music side of things. So I'm curious, like when, maybe as a baby, like what pops into mind when you think of your first musical memory? Oh, man. So I was, you know, I was fortunate enough that my parents started us out as a young, age, you know, young age. My siblings and I, um, five years old, we kind of all, you know, tried an instrument, and drums came to me naturally. So, you know, by five, six years old, I was, you know, it's kind of time we have like a little recital. So, whether it's a good moment or a bad moment, my first musical uh, memory that I have is when it was my turn to play next at the drum recital when I was six years old and I freaked out and cried and refused to go on stage <laughs> and I like ran out of the building and my parents and siblings still uh, give me grief to this day. We'll just be like eating dinner sometime, you know, and my, my sister would be like, remember you cried at your recital? <laughs> so... That's a funny first experience that I remember because I never actually made it to performing. Yeah, you know, I yeah, just, no, that's I freaked great. out. Yeah. <laughs> so, How long did it take you uh, mentally before you were able to get on stage? You know, that was just a, a one-time thing. You know, I was I was still pretty young. I think I was you know five or six yeah, years old. Yeah, so no, it's understandable. You know, there were probably twenty people in the room, and I think I you know it was a hand percussion recital too. I don't even think I had to play the full kit. So you know, it was. I think I just had a freak out moment and then after that everything kind of came natural you know I was you know I was lucky enough that by the time I was nine ten years old you know I was able to start playing some local shows and I, it, it was a lot more comfortable how old are your siblings my brother is uh, just a couple years older than me he's 31 I believe and um, my sister's 20 and yeah, we got a nice little little gap there. But they they both play. My brother plays everything. My sister is an awesome bass player. So whenever we're home, we you know even growing up, especially you know my brother, he you know I wouldn't be where I am today without you know him just constantly you know pushing me to practice jam, teaching me new music. So he you know he really helped shape how where I got where I am musically. So you you drifted towards the drums almost instantly did you did you veer off did you pick up any other instruments on the way 
Not really. Like I said, my brother was kind of, he's kind of that guy where he, you know, he's like, oh, look, is that a harmonica? And pick it up and just start, you know, ripping it. Like it's, he can kind of, he just kind of gets it and it's great. I was always kind of just stuck with that more percussive rhythmic mind where drums just kind of always sucked to me. I've, I've dabbled, you know, with guitars and other stuff just to, just to have fun with, but, um, kind of always been a percussion man there are different types of percussion i play you know i've been experimenting with like uh the hand pan drum um and certain you know percussion percussion drums from around the world so i kind of stay in that world though <laughs> after you know you got over the stage anxiety you know what was the first uh show that you performed like how did you get your foot in the door in the music industry yeah so as far as, you know, just a local thing, growing up, like I said, my brother, a couple years older than me, you know, we both took to music pretty naturally. And, you know, by the time he was 10 and I was eight, you know, we already had a local friend and we developed, a, you know, a blues rock band called Hurricane. <laughs> I still have some of our original merch. <laughs> but um, honestly, you know, we got our parents, you know, helped us get some shows here and there and we even got a couple cool shows at some local bar like blues bars you know stormy monday's blues bar i don't think my parents told them really much info because when we showed up as like little kids with our instruments they just laughed and they had no idea so there were a bunch of shows like that where we would just show up and the people would be like are you serious this is the band so and you know i have vivid memories of you know, sitting up on the house drum kit and having to adjust things because my feet don't even hit the pedals yet. That's great. And, you know, we'd get grief from the venues. They, You know, I remember one venue is like, let's get these kids up here so that they can go to bed. And, uh, you know, we were honestly pretty good for, I think, for our age. And we were, But we were playing, you know, Purple Haze and songs that we had no idea what they meant or anything. So <laughs> it was... It was a fun experience. And, you know, just those... I You know, I come from a small New England town, so... Just growing up playing, you know, Cape Cod, those little kind of blues bars in, in random towns, those are, you know, the first great memories. And like I said, you know, I kind of, as, as time went on, I always played local shows and, you know, whether it was in New York City or just kind of the Northeast, but I didn't really get a taste of that, you know, that big stage energy um, other than maybe a few few little session gigs and stuff here and there until, you know, I was able to join up with Pigeons and they helped me grow in that stage. So when you were first showing up, I'm just curious, how old were you? Like when your parents um, were driving you? Oh, at, at those original yeah, gigs? Yeah. Nine years old, I, yeah. Wow. And my brother was like 11. That's awesome. And I think our guitarist was somewhere in between. And um, yeah, you know, I, and you know, my brother being a couple years older, we would always play like his high school battle of bands and stuff. And I, you know, I remember still being in like sixth grade and stuff. So it was, it was fun playing, playing those shows. It was kind of weird. Cause you know, everything, everyone's just like, who are these kids? But, uh, yeah, it was, fun. that's great. <laughs> I want to kind of transition towards, you know, when you started playing with pigeons and you know, what was new about the experience or, or what was it that drew, drew you in to play? Yeah, you know, it's, I think in a general stance, you know, it's, it, it was, you know, the entire lifestyle. Like, I, I grew up always having, like, a really serious passion for music and kind of had that dream of doing it, you know, professionally and touring. Um, but I always knew that, you know, that could be a, a grinding lifestyle. And, you know, it's not all, you know, it's it's a amazing you know, we're super fortunate to do it, but you know, it's, it's a grind. And a lot of the times, you know, it, it, you know, bef this is before I'm in pigeons, you know, a lot of times thinking about that life, things don't work out. And then, you know, where are you left with? So I was growing up, I was kind of always teetering with, do I really want to commit myself fully to music? But I, I had the passion and love for it. It was just kind of, you know, unsure about the lifestyle. And, you know, I always had, you know, I went to school for architecture while doing music and, you know, after school, after college, I was still playing shows on the weekend while working, you know, as an architectural engineer and working up in that world at, during the week. So I was kind of like splitting my life and I was really, you know, grinding just doing those two. And, you know, it was a good grind because it, it led me to where I am today. But, 
you know, once I was able to, you know, reach out and, you know, meet pigeons and then they asked me to audition and, you know, it all happened, you know, all worked out super naturally. I think the biggest change was, you know, like I was saying, is the lifestyle, tra you know, traveling, you know, just going from a structured, you know, regular job to, you know, not really, you know, having a schedule or the schedule you do have, it's completely flip flopped and it's, you know, it's been great. It's every day, it's new experience, you know, it's when you're on the road, it's, it's just, it's, it is that constant grind, but you know, you learn to, to kind of find this synergy with it and once you're kind of in the flow of that tour just kind of the daily life you know new towns you know going out to find food going to sound check just kind of the whole lifestyle in general you know it takes a lot to kind of get used to but once you get in kind of that flow and you can kind of appreciate everything and take it day by day you know it's it's rewarding and it's awesome so that's interesting that you you were working as a architectural engineer and then made the jump and i assume you're not doing that anymore is that correct correct you know it's still something i always i always loved but you know i was uh, yeah it was just kind of that like i said i was kind of scared to kind of jump in deep with music of course and, but once i was able to find you know a great group of guys um pigeons being you know the change what yeah. was it that gave you the assurance or the confidence that you could dive in full time and and make it you know it was it was tough i was you know that you know when i first got the initial communication i had you know coincidentally if i take it back just for a second in college i went to school in hartford connecticut uh, along with my brother my older brother you know we're best friends i followed him to college you know we played music and we we played in a great college band um with a guitarist ari lesser still a great friend and play with him to this day he's from you know baltimore area where pigeons is from so in college we're playing and you know one summer he's like let's go down to my hometown and play you know it was an opening for pigeons so i kind of just randomly met them through that and then but this is years later you know i'm working working my job like i said and uh you know i got a random call one day and it was jeremy our guitarist and he kind of you know mentioned the situation and how he had remembered my playing and you know just asked just general interest and you know at the time it was just you know it was like so exciting and didn't really know i'm like yeah let me <laughs> kind of gather my thoughts and um you know i was in this pivotal kind of part of life kind of where i was just getting into settled and that was a great job and i enjoyed it and it was you know it was a great job and you know i kind of i had that fear you know like what if i leave this that i'm just getting settled in and it doesn't work out but you know, I could, I had a good feeling and those guys you could tell were hard workers and that they were just kind of, you know, they were, you could see that they were taking off and they were onto something special. And as far as support from others, you know, my parents have been the greatest support system ever. You know, they also, you know, it's also a world that, which, you know, most people don't know that world too much but it's the you know the music kind of world the touring world it was something that was a little foreign so you know i didn't wasn't i knew they'd be supportive but i wasn't sure you know like what, what exact feedback and you know at the time in my life i was you know 24 at the time or something and you know they right away my dad was like the times now you're doing this like this is what you were here for and you know hey you're so young if it doesn't work out you know we're here for you you know the company was like they were they even said that they're like that's oh, awesome man if it doesn't work out you always have a home here so after that it was just like kind of too good to be true every how it just kind of all you know i after that i packed up my car and drove down to baltimore and moved in with some strangers and uh started my my totally different life but I, I don't regret anything. It's been amazing. That's great. And where are you currently? Uh, just outside of Baltimore. Uh, the band started at University of Maryland. Local. Um, the base, Our bass player, Ben, and our lead guitarist, Jeremy, are both from this area. Uh, Greg's from... Greg, our lead singer and rhythm guitarist, is from Long Island, um, but went to University of Maryland. And they, they started the band there. And it, Jeremy, you know, freshman year in the dorms was was just chilling in his dorm playing acoustic guitar and Greg our singer walked down the hall didn't know him 
It's like, hey man, I got a guitar, let's jam, you know, and it started as a little acoustic duo in college, and that was the original Pigeons, you know, playing playing covers in college, and it really grew from, from you know, a, you know, step one, it really, and, you know, Jeremy, our, our guitarist, he's just, along with everyone, like everyone's work ethic, they just were able to just take it to the moon, and, you know, they were already a few years into touring, and had a you know had just created a great album psychology um when i kind of linked up with them so like i said i could kind of see that they were on that progression yeah help and what is it about their work ethic or strategies that they use to that really elevate their ability to create music they're so they, they they're all hard workers and they're just always kind of always working on new ways but with kind of that light-hearted you know attitude they're never you know jeremy you never see him crazy stressed out working on stuff he just always has you know stuff figured out and he's just always kind of having fun with more ways and you know we're a very you know happy positive you know happy energy group and you know we kind of we like to bring that to our work ethic and kind of you know we get together still when we're home and off tours you know a few days a week all day just to just to jam sometimes and work on new stuff and we're just always trying to push and as we've been fortunate enough to kind of keep growing you know it's it, it's it's only kind of fed us to you know all right we got to keep this thing going and you know riding that wave rather than just kind of getting comfortable with it so they're all hard workers they all love to play we all love music i mean most guys in this profession <laughs> or most people in this profession um do you know, we're also not afraid to listen to and play a lot of new music too, which is fun. You know, our our sound, on a general sense, you know, is pretty. You know, funky, dancey can have a, a a simpler basis in the sound, but you know, it's we're always trying to listen to and play new new things just to add certain int intricacies that I think kind of shine as as we play more. So I'm I'm interested in like your. Per productivity and when you guys record or when you make music is it scheduled or is it unscheduled as as far as writing new music it's it's there's a lot of different avenues that that we take you know like i said when we're home we all live pretty close to each other and we have a great practice space so we you know we'll meet up during the week we'll meet up and um for a few hours just to some, like I said, we record everything and we'll just sometimes just improv jam for, you know, and if something catches, catches our ear, we'll stop. A lot of the times, you know, we'll still work on stuff at our own homes just because we love doing it and we'll send out files to each other. Hey, here's a cool new song idea. Feel free to add to it. And we have, you know, a bunch of, we have an endless list of all these shared, you know, new song documents where we can kind of just keep going and from our home add in different parts, especially during these times you know, we're able to be creative at home so that when we do get together the next day, you know, we could be efficient with it. And um, sometimes we'll just be on a long tour, grueling tour, and we'll be in a 20 hour car ride or van or ride or bus ride. And someone will just start singing a, a random, Greg will just start singing a random line. Like, just because we're all losing our minds in the, in, in, in the car for 20 hours. And those have developed into like many choruses. So it's, it didn't come from just yelling a goofy thing to kind of having more of that structured approach. But I think the one thing, you know, we each have our own flavor, I think. And when we do come together in person, you know, whether someone came in with more of a solidified idea, we're still everyone's so open to allowing people to put their own flair on it. Nice. You know, like maybe for the first time we'll run through it straight. But then like we're always cool with, all right, Ben, now like spice it up. All right, you know. Jeremy, now give it a cool like line. You know, it's everyone's very open to work with each other, and I think that's that's very important, obviously. So I'm just curious, any uh, particular song come to mind that you guys wrote uh, in the bus, just from a one-liner? There's a song we play called Sukasa that was just, and it's 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 kind of a, you know it's a nice song. It's kind of a pretty melody, and it's you know the lyrics are great, and it's a more kind of heartfelt feeling song.
and the chorus is, you know, this is our home now. And that actually, <laughs> we were all on the bus one time watching a funny show, Vice Principals, and there was like a hilarious episode and we were all tired and having fun. And there was like a line in the show where he looks at him, he's like, this is our home now. So for a while that was just like, kind of a funny joke we would have about this night where we were all watching this funny show and that was like this big line and ended up you know we at sound checks would be playing songs and we'd kind of just sing out funny things we heard and then that one ended up being part of a chorus and that you know that's just an ode to a funny show we were watching having a fun night and uh i don't know there, there's always been some kind of funny hooks that will start just by getting weird in the van and they'll kind of develop into other things. That's great. When you guys record music, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned you guys send files back and forth. Do you have like a personal home studio? I see that you've got sound treatment behind you. You know, when we're first developing new song ideas, we have a program, it's a program called Splice that, you know, we were able to kind of, all of our home recordings, we're able to cre kind of create a shared document so everyone can work on it. But we don't, we don't use that approach where I'm actually creating you know, album recordings. Um, Just for in the past, ideation. In the past, we've had a great local studio, uh, Rightway Studios. Steve Wright's an engineer producer that we've worked with. Um, so it is a nice, great local spa, but it's a, it's a great professional studio. Um, so we've actually, we've gone there for our actual, you know, production and recording for our albums. Um, but, you know, when we're just kind of home creating new stuff and you know that's the approach we'll take is we'll kind of just be able to record yeah i have a little kind of recording little drum room here everyone kind of has their own respective practice room and you know it could be even during the day you hear something in your head you just run over and you know record the line add it to the file and share it be like here's a cool little idea feel free to join and you know you end up with this list some are more developed than others and you know, we'll even sometimes prioritize, you know, go through before practice, prioritize what we want to dive into more. And, you know, it's with the technology these days, it's it, it allows kind of an ongoing creative process rather than kind of showing up all together and kind of one by one being like, I had this idea, I had this idea all at once. You know, you just kind of like it's hard to digest and, you know, process all that information this way we're able to kind of have everything listed out you could add notes to it and you know we don't even need to be you know what we do love getting together and we practice like that but when we are home and doing our own thing we could still if we're able you know have that creative process and be able to just kind of keep rolling the ball and uh it's been really beneficial for us when we're off tour and kind of just trying to grow and develop new things. And how do you guys stay organized? You mentioned Splice, but do you guys have any method, like keep each song in a folder or, you know, any any hack out there that you've learned over the years? It's pretty straightforward. The, the program we do yeah, use is called Splice. It's through, you know, we use, uh, for at least for our home recordings, we use Logic Pro for the most part. And um, it's basically just kind of, once you update and save a file, you have like a master active Splice list and it just organizes everything kind of just by, you know, most recent. If we're trying to, and you can, you, there's different ways for notifying. You can add in an email if like you made any changes that way. If you can kind of have like kind of documented list of how everything was changing. You could add in little comments. It, it really allows you to be, it's actually a great, great product. We just started using it this past year and nice. it's been pretty great. So that's logic, but it integrates with Splice and Splice does the notifications and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting. Just, there's always an active list that kind of once someone makes a new change, it brings that one to the top list. You can you can um, organize the list however you want. And then, you know, you, you have you can in what the big thing is once you create a new create a new recording or file, you then add collaborators. You know, I could add in, you know, you. I could add in anyone who's on Splice just to, hey, feel free to make some edits and check out this project, you know. Cool. And it's, you know, it's... And it's, it's the whole it's Logic great... project floating around that people can copy or float or mess yeah, with. Yeah, right. And then once they update it and save it, it, it just goes back to Splice and it, it notifies everyone that... And that, you can go you know, back through the versions. Yeah, you have awesome. all the versions. It even lit. Yeah, it's great. It's a great, yeah. great tool. No, no, I'm sold. I, I I thought it was only for finding samples, but uh... see, it's funny because 
I actually didn't even really know about the sample side of it until recently. I started having fun with them, and some of my friend was like, yeah, that's actually like what, it's mostly a sample thing. This was kind of a different side of it, but um, yeah, it's been great. I would definitely recommend, cool. you know, to anyone who's kind of has that remote kind of creativity while working with other people. When you're on stage jamming, uh, first of all, do you use inner ear monitors? Yeah, I use a I use an ear monitor system. I actually use a hardwired um, system. It's not wireless either. It's just it, it's still the same size pack. I just kind of wear it on wear it on my belt. I don't really necessarily need the wireless. And then, drums. do you have like a little mixer that you get to control your levels? You know, locally. No, I. I I have, we have a monitor engineer. Uh, okay. We're lucky enough to have our front of house engineer and we have a mo our own monitor engineer. So in most cases, we don't, tr um, we try, you know, we have our own monitor board as well. So in vast majority of tour situations, he's able kind of just to load up our mix. And it's also nice. someone we trust and like. So, you know, it's usually a pretty easy adjustment overall. Um, you know, he'll hear our mixes too and he's got a good ear. So, to, you know, it is nice to sometimes have, your own little mix we we kind of like to just have that trust in someone just that's great to let, offload yeah. that thought process too yeah and just live too i mean not that it's a big deal but like aesthetically and everything you don't want to just be like messing with levels and stuff on stage sure. necessarily and it, it is nice and you can do it in a discreet way obviously and it's but we are just lucky enough that we have a good good engineer yeah that's great so do you feel like you're working closer with the the engineer on stage versus front of house yeah definitely as far as you know live shows you know a lot of the time being drummer i don't even have you know the greatest visual connection with front of the house yeah. actually most of the times you know we also have a Blinded. crazy light show yeah it's a big part of ours so honestly even seeing people in the front row is tough sometimes so in an emergency situation even if i need to signal something to uh to front of house i'll typically always go right to our monitor engineer who's side who's you know, stage side or our tour manager you know nine times out of the ten will be there unless he's you know taking photos or kind of running around doing something he'd be there for signaling and we're able to discreetly if i really need something i can kind of just you know wide eye come here and worst case he'll you know just run on the back of the stage and I can tell him something. So it's a good process. You know, we try to keep in mind of having a good, clean communication. You know, you don't want to be up there, you know, saying into the mic, hey, can I get more yeah. kick drum in the monitor? You know, that's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, you know, being efficient. And we've, we've been fortunate to have a good group of guys. So. That's great. So did you guys like uh, master your own hand signals? Like create some sign language? <laughs> yeah. or? Outside of even the sound part of it you know signals and hand signals is comes into a play a lot with even our our music playing you know where our live shows a lot of improv based um music and a lot of that comes from you know communication and little signals even like wide eyes you know we have a lot of different mouth signals you know i might not divulge what they all mean but okay. you know if I look at you and stick my tongue out a little bit, that's gonna let you know that something's gonna happen. You know, sometimes people might crouch their knee, you know, you see Greg look back and crouch his knees a little bit for a second, that that signal might mean something, you know. Uh, like a wide eye, turn back wide eye, or you know, a wink, or um, you know, a, there's just different little funny things we've developed over time. <laughs> yeah, no, I like and, that. Uh, it, it, it plays into a lot of our improv. Seems like the wide eye, might be hard to uh, go wider because uh, up, up on stage they're yeah. pretty frequently yeah. pretty wide eyed. And Greg, you know, yeah. Greg, our singer, he's already got such crazy eyes. I don't even know if you watch out some some footage from our live show. The guy's eye game is on point. Yeah, so, uh... Uh, <laughs> no kidding. When you're when you're creating music, because it's so uh, improvisation and jammy, um, you get to enjoy that too. But you still have to stay organized and keep people on track, and then make the shift when it needs to happen. So yeah. I guess I'm just uh, curious because sometimes you synchronize what you're doing with what uh, other band members are playing. So sometimes, yeah. you know, you'll hear the bass and the kick drum just boom. They're just on point all of a sudden. And it's very intentional. And then other times you'll be hitting the snare with other notes on the guitar, higher notes. Um, so I, I just wonder, when do you decide to sync up and when do you decide to like lay the foundation for for others? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, 
it's actually funny. I was just having a drum lesson last night with a student who was kind of asking the same thing, you know, playing along with guitars, matching up, you know, on certain aspects and kind of like what you said, leaning off on other times. It's, you know, typically with the drums and the bass, you know, for the most part, the kick drum and the bass rhythm structurally, you know, in, it's going to kind of link up and kind of produce the same kind of bottom rhythm. So, you know, when you vary from it's sometimes it's cool to do the opposite, you know, match up is great, but sometimes it's cool to do an off rhythm and kind of fill the gaps the other way. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, guitar or if Jeremy's on a lead solo and, you know, he's doing a rising kind of triplet thing and I can kind of match him on a drum fill, you know, that that's obviously, you know, that stuff is more, you know, easier as you, obviously as you play with someone more, you get more comfortable with kind of, you know, that what they they may do. But that's, you know, that's just a huge, a big part of those live improv shows is kind of taking risks live, you know. And it's kind of scary because you want to be as tight as you possibly can, but you still want to be free with your improv. And, you know, there's times where it might not totally link up, but like when you do, it creates those moments. And I think it's about kind of not overdoing those moments. And that can come with just those, you know, those simple little lines where we match up that kind of, you know, turn people's heads or kind of give them the old stink face you know like they're into the groove like really matching that kick and bass but then kind of you know treating it as a moment and not overdoing it you know you don't want to totally synchronize every line or you know fill a song with a bunch of kind of syncopated you know lines but if you do it you know every now and then or if as you're peaking you throw one in on a certain jam it kind of creates those more epic moments and it takes patience it's it's hard, you know, sometimes you just want to keep ripping and that, and I think that, you know, this, this topic, it goes along with kind of, you know, specific lines, but it also kind of relates to just the energy of playing throughout a show. And like, you know, when we're peaking a solo or a jam, you know, every song, when you're doing that, you really just want to like get at it, but you got to also step back and treat the show with those moments too, you know, like you want to crank it up here, but you don't want to peek out to that point every song throughout the show because it's kind of, you know, you want to create those moments, maybe take this jam and Poseidon a little deeper and really make it more epic so it kind of creates those flows. So it's all just different moments and creating, not overdoing it. And it's tough because you just like to wail away. And <laughs> of course. But, yeah. you know, it's just... Yeah, just kind of creating those moments. And do you guys go into the show knowing which songs you're going to be emphasizing or which ones are going to be the peaks and valleys? Or does that kind of just work itself out? You know, some songs have kind of developed, you know, I'd say probably, you know, with with most live-oriented acts, you know, you could kind of, or fans of that group can kind of know that one song might typically contain, you know, more long, drawn-out jam. But as far as... You know, deciding which ones are really going to be kind of the overtop jam that we kind of let those try to come to us. There are some songs that, you know, for the most part, we'll play more straight up in, you know, not that there's a right way or wrong or wrong way to do it, but we'll try to kind of have a little more contrast in our sets where if we do take a couple songs really deep, we'll toss in a saw, you know, a more of a straight, straight non, you know, a look. <laughs> for shorter for us like a five minute you know five yeah. six minute song as opposed to an 18 minute jam so it's you know it's well well we kind of know which songs may can end up containing more of a drawn out jam you know we surprise ourselves sometimes after shows where it's like wow like havana jam was actually like the one that ended up you know really taking off not that that you know it's just a more typically when you compare it to, you know, more intense song, you know, Avalanche or something, you know, sometimes it takes us off our own surprise or some develop more into ways that we didn't necessarily have in vision. So nice. So a little, a little of both. Yeah. Well, you just touched on both songs that I wanted to talk about. You know, I, I have oh, to wow. pick and choose. I can't go for too many, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I wanted to talk about Havana uh, for oh, cool. to start out and Avalanche. So you happen to mention both of those. Uh, so first of all, Havana.
it's a, I, I would think you might agree, an instrumental. Yeah. There's no vocals. Yeah, um, no vocals in uh, either of those songs, actually. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, I would think most of your songs do have vocals. But, um, but this one in particular, I wanted to pluck out because um, there's just some interesting elements of the, the rhythm that I would like to chat about. So first of all, you're going like a machine on the hi-hat at first. <laughs> And, yeah. and, uh, but then you kind of give space, you move off of that hi hat, and uh, I think you're playing the, the cymbals a little bit more. Then uh, there's moments where you hit, I, I want to call it like the center of the cymbal. It's like a bell, you know, it like really pops. Yep, you're right. Yep, I, the bell, yeah. What do you call it? Yeah, it's actually called the bell. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Uh, <laughs> it just sounds like a bell. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyways, uh, but I, I notice it because it's so precise where it's located, where you hit it. Um, it's thoughtful and at the same time it's really sparse like it's it's rare so it like oh that's cool oh that's cool and then Thanks. you move away from it and then I'm you know kind of excited for it to come back and then I have to be very patient um, <laughs> so I'm just curious you know how, how do you create these different spaces intra song like within a song uh, you know from the intro where you're working on the hi-hat a lot to kind of more elevated rhythm yeah, no, that's a great question. I appreciate that, that what you said too. Um, yeah, that's a good example, I think, that kind of shows kind of an underlying, you know, mood, vibe, contrast with the rhythm as kind of the song progresses. You know, the hi-hat parts are a little more, you know, obviously when you're playing on a cymbal or a ride, you know, the sound is a little more long and drawn out as opposed to a short, focused hi-hat. So, you know, it's, you know, you kind of have, that section of the song is kind of more of a, a kind of, uh, you know, developing the rhythm, you know, more kind of shorter notes. And then when it's, when I do switch over to the ride initially, you know, it kind of opens it up a little bit. Um, you know, you'll hear during that part, Jeremy, our guitarist kind of creates, uh, his starts a guitar line that's very kind of long and you know, drawn out and kind of symphonic as opposed to kind of staccato, uh, short notes. So I'm kind of just trying to match the vibe of him with like a bigger ride symbol that has more vibrato. Um, so it kind of loosens. And then you were talking about the, the bell, which I eventually kind of add in. And that kind of, I think, you know, we started with that, that hi-hat kind of more focused rhythm. We go to the ride, which is kind of more of a drawn out, you know, I kind of like to picture a graphic, kind of more of a drawn out. And then that adding that bell kind of, I feel like kind of meets them in the middle. You know, it's hitting the bell where I do is, you know, it's called an offbeat. You'll typically hear it more on, you know, dancey kind of, it creates a, you know, a oot cha to oot cha to oot cha to instead of just a do you know, like, instead of just dead on the rhythm, it kind of creates that more kind of back and forth hop bounce. So, you know, I'll start the hi-hat, ride, open it, and I think adding that bell kind of meets it in the middle where it still creates kind of that long tone, but with more of a focused rhythm. And, um, you know, with help from you know, good cymbals and a good uh, recording engineer, it... it it, you know, it, it comes out nice in the mix and, um, you know, I'll do a lot of that, um, bell work specifically with pigeons, um, you know, live or in the studio. And I just, I like how you can kind of create that long, you know, drawn out wash of the cymbal, but then counteract it with that more focused, punchy kind of note. So that's kind of what I'm doing there is I'm kind of just trying to, which I do with most songs, they're kind of just trying to rhythmically you know whether it's graphically i'm thinking about you know kind of just either a progression or kind of just ways to kind of meet them and tell a story rhythmically not just necessarily within the notes that we're playing so yeah yeah well i appreciate that and and tell me if i'm wrong but you're kind of thinking like an eq when you're visualizing things horizontally yeah and you know drums in general i always kind of try i like to everything i guess i try to like to picture kind of graphically and yeah i kind of the hi hat kind of more spiky shorter notes and the, the the you know the ride more drawn out long and it's exactly it's like an eq kind of 
uh, creating a, a, a smooth analyzer. rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I appreciate that you you mentioned that you had to create that wash in mm-hmm. order for those bells to pop. Um, and for those listening, and tell me if I'm wrong, please. Uh, but I think it's the same symbol. So you're, you're just playing a different location on the symbol that creates that wash, and then you pluck that bell out, and it pops, and it like separates itself from that uh, kind of long tail sound. Right. Yeah, I'm going back and forth on the same symbol. You know, the longer body of the symbol is going to create like you said that longer warmer note and then that upper part that bell you know just the shape of it alone gives it that high pitch crack so yeah i'm using the same symbol so it's crazy that that you know that creates such a wide variety of sounds if anyone's curious uh the symbol i use that ride symbol i use with pigeons is a zildjian 22 just regular k ride and um it's just I think it's a nice ride for pigeons because it's it, the bottom half creates that warmth, but you still get the focus of the bell. So yeah, do you play with a click? No, we don't. Um, we've never played live with a click. You know, not even every studio song we play with a click. Obviously, it's a great tool if you're gonna record everything completely live. You know, feel free to wail away and. It doesn't matter as much but if you're gonna you know edit or add in any sort of additions or punch-ins recording wise it really does help in the studio unless you know your drummer has the best timing or if it's a song that some just feel better just doing it a feel you know we have some song some songs where the chorus you know is a little more on the back of the beat and a little chiller and then the verse and it's just kind of naturally how it's developed so some we won't at all, but as far as our live performance, we, we don't play with a click. Um, I do have an electronic drum pad for effects and filler sounds and stuff that I use a decent amount, um, but they're not really click oriented. There's a couple that are in a tempo, but I'm just able to hear it enough in my ears without the click that I can still play along to it. So. Nice. Our shows itself are just free flowing. What software are you running with the electronic drum kit? Honestly, it's or, or just, it just um, loaded, like you got it's six just a Roland SPDSX uh, drum pad. It's a square pad with eight eight things, and it's all just got a module on that, and that literally just runs that on its own. I don't nice. need to run it into a computer or anything. I you know when I'm not on stage, if I'm going to upload sounds to it or new samples, then. Um, you can use any software, really. It comes with its own program to upload them, or, you know, you could just... It has got a USB thing in the back. I always have my little stick on my keys, so when we, if nice. we're playing a show where I necessarily don't have my pad or we're traveling and, you know, you could just load your USB on it, you know, program the sounds in, and boom, so... Yeah, so I noticed uh, in one of your profiles, you brought the Electro Swag. So is that the... <laughs> yeah. is that the uh, the, yeah, I don't know how they got that. I got that title. I don't know if I'm deserving the electro swag, but I try to throw some electro swag in there. We nice. we have some pretty fun. We have some fun stuff, and then also as like a little funny thing, I'll I'll I'll, I'll program like funny movie quotes or like stuff that during sound checks, I'll just like we're going streaking, you know, <laughs> just from you know, I'll just hit random pads and it'll be nice. Ma the meatloaf from Wedding Grant, you know. I'll just put like Will Ferrell stuff on there and scare people during sound checks. So uh, it's a fun device. Looking back, maybe as a as a band or individually, your choice. Um, was there any perceived failure that helped set you up for future success, or setback, or at the moment, you know, maybe you failed that talent show, or you didn't get first place, or whatever it was. Yeah, I mean, there's been a solid, you know, there's been a, a few of those probably, you know, as the kind of the long progression has gone, you know, I obviously told you the funny story earlier, but well, now it's funny. <laughs> it, was, it was always funny, just not to me, <laughs> of my, you know, five-year-old drum recital running out. So, you know, who knows if I, that, that played anything as a part because I was just so young. But yeah, you know, I was, I always had kind of a hunger and a drive to keep going. I was... You know, typically the younger younger guy playing in groups and stuff. My brother, you know, he'd help me get gigs and stuff, and he was a little older. So, you know, I always kind of had that drive. You know, I would, I would do some competitions every now and then, you know, in college. 
I remember doing the Guitar Center drum offs a couple times, and you know, I'd make it through to the states, and then you know, you I'd lose a round, and you know, that stuff would get to me a lot. But you know, it's you know, you kind of learn to grow, and I'm at a point with you know drumming and music where I've really been able to kind of just as you know general and cheesy as a sound respect it as an art and like there's no right and wrong way to do it and there's no like you know I love drummers that play extremely fast and loud and I love pocket drummers like Questlove who just groove all day and um you know a little off topic there but like just playing and gaining experience and meeting and just seeing you know meeting people I look up to puts a lot of stuff in perspective like they're just you know, it's just a chill guy. He just has that drive. So, you know, there weren't any really big defeating moments. You know, I've been fortunate to have, you know, a great kind of, it's still a pretty new feeling career with it all. But, you know, obviously this whole time has been a, been a tough, you know, has been probably the biggest obstacle we've dealt with is just, you know, learning to stay creative and, kind of roll with the punches and we were so on this you know we were so used to being on our our to long tour runs and we had so much momentum going everyone you know that it's it's just it this has probably been our biggest test and you know we've had frustrations and little things that come up all the time on tours but you know there haven't been you know we're fortunate enough we haven't had any really big defeating moments you know on stage or anything other than you know, just growing as a band, you know, everyone goes through tough grinding shows where, you know, you're trying to make it and you put all this work into a show and no one shows up to it, you know, and, you know, there's countless of those. And I think you need those to kind of get through the grind and appreciate everything. So just the grind in general, it just yeah. never stops and just finding ways to break through and appreciate it. Right now we're recording is uh, 2021, but you know, past year, everybody was closed for COVID. Um, music industry, just live music, ground to a halt, basically. And then some yeah. online shows started popping up. But how how were you guys able to work with what was available, which might be extra time at home or extra time off of the tour? Uh, what, what strategies have you guys been using? Yeah, you know, it's for every, you know, everyone, not even in the music world. It's obviously been tough. You know, it's brought great things, too. You know, we've we've had you know our, our greg had a you know a, a, and his, him and his wife had a baby girl and you know jeremy got married and you know ben our bass player him and his girl moved into a great new spot so you know we've we've been fortunate and blessed to have still you know been able to live our lives and be creative but you know the main thing is we're so used to just constantly having that go and being on the go and being on tour that you know obviously it was just, you know, adjusting the approach to how for years we've been so used to approaching, you know, just the general life and, you know, rehearsals and writing and everything. So, you know, we touched a base on a lot of it earlier with kind of how we've been able to stay creative, you know, but it, it, it's also allowed us to kind of be more creative on our own, explore avenues on our own while having time away and, you know, while it's hasn't been ideal at all you know i do think that you know when you do kind of have some time off and away and then get back together it does you know it does make it we were already we already loved it so much that it does make it you know just even more exciting to play again and you know we've been fortunate that we've we've been able to play some drive-in shows social distancing shows and getting back on the road slowly and surely and you know having our own festival dome fest which we did a virtual version this past year of and um you know just finding ways to cope i think we've we, we've been fortunate like i said and blessed and able to keep going because for a lot of people it's it's been really tough and um you know just kind of keeping that grind going and it's definitely been, been a, an obstacle but it's brought a new perspective and we're so excited to get back out on the road. Do you guys have any recordings that you're currently working on? Anything that you want to tease or share that might come out in the next year? Oh man, but can't divulge anything yet, but okay. I mean. But you guys got stuff in the works. 
we got so much in the works that we don't even know what to do with it all. <laughs> we're, we're, we're excited about it. Yeah. You know, we have a lot. We've never been able to really just hone in on working on new music this much. And it, it's just, it's been exciting. Couple questions here. So what's the best investment that you've ever made? It could be time or money. Yeah, probably just growing up and practicing. And, you know, it's... It's tough when you're growing up and you have so many new interests and you're going through life and everything. And I was just lucky to have, you know, great parents, great dad who would just, you know, constantly be interested in, you know, what I practice today and, you know, how much I practice today. And, you know, there's all those times when you're growing up at the time where it's just, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm tired from school and, you know, just getting over the hump. And, you know, I was really able to you know, learn to get like a regimented, you know, and to really be able to know that it's going to pay off, go hard, you know, work hard, play hard. So, you know, just dedicating that early time in those early grinds and <laughs> playing all those empty, you know, rooms and everything, just the experience. So I think dedicating time to that, you know, what's the worst advice that you've ever been given musically? Oh. Not who, but what well if it, whether it was direct advice or not i we saw a great drummer who we were excited about playing a sh seeing play a show a local show um with this like singer songwriter group he opened the show with a drum solo <laughs> then played like a drum solo in the first song and then like at the end of hit played like another drum solo so i quickly learned not to do that in certain settings <laughs> so because it stinks when you see someone who's so good, but they're just like, just going nuts and not playing, um, playing musically or. No, that's uh, great. And then uh, the counter, what's the best advice that you've ever been given? Uh, Perhaps for music, maybe life, you know, whatever. Yeah. Pops up. I mean, always order two beers at last call is great <laughs> advice. <laughs> <laughs> my dad taught me that at a young age as cheesy as it is with music i mean just like appreciating like everything involved so like you know the on stage part's amazing and the best part but like you know waking up in that new city just take advantage of like walking down the street and like visiting a coffee shop or a cool restaurant or just looking like you know every little aspect you know we're, we're we're we realize how lucky and fortunate you know we are to be in this position so just really just diving into every single part of it and then what advice would you give somebody starting out today so they're young they're hardworking, creative somebody who wants to make it in the music industry you know kind of along the lines of just that grind of what we were talking about is just you know realizing and knowing that you're gonna go you know, you're going to be defeated a bunch and go through tough times. And also knowing that, you know, there's millions and millions of other people working just as hard, if not harder at it. So, you know, yeah, there's a lot of luck. Yeah, there's a lot of timing, but just getting over those, those, those bumps and just realizing that it can, you know, if you dig, you can, you can get there. It's just like we talked about earlier there's a lot of kind of defeating moments in the lifestyle and kind of being able to get to that hump and just kind of powering through what about uh going back to your your songs when you're playing live on stage real quick uh yeah you know is there any favorite moment that you have is there a favorite groove favorite song you know what stands out in a great set for you it sounds silly i love all the tunes you know i think our our songs have a lot of intricacies and differences you know even if they seem to have a same general basis or tempo or kind of vibe you know we have a lot of little intricacies when it comes to certain moments you know energy wise like high energy moments you know songs like ocean flows towards the end of a song towards the end of a set you know that second half you know just looking out and seeing you know, people who are into it jumping around. It's a really high energy moment. And then you have like moments like the intro of Horizon where live, you know, our guitarist Jeremy will kind of just do this nice intro. And it's, you know, I'm not even playing that part, but it's nice for me to actually, 
you know, just sit back and I'll take my ears out and kind of just sometimes I'll get I'll sit on the side of the drum riser and kind of just chill and soak it in. So, you know, it really changes night to night. Sometimes it's those high energy moments and then sometimes it's more of those kind of just sit back and kind of take in the moment. Um, so, yeah, it kind of changes. A lot of different moments keep pointing you back to like just take it in in the moment, whether it be walking yeah. through a new city sitting on the drum riser when you're not playing and enjoying the experience. Yeah. How do you get your mind to the present? Do you meditate? Uh, do you do any other practices? What do you use to uh, gather your mind? I don't necessarily meditate. I. It's just kind of just been adjusting to kind of, you know, finding the best, most kind of, I don't know, kind of efficient way to go throughout each day. Like I kind of came from, you know, more of a analytical, always have to have my day planned out mind. Like, where am I going to be at this time tomorrow? And for a while it took me, you know, mentally a while to kind of make that transition of like, not really knowing what the heck's going to happen that day and having such a hectic kind of schedule and lifestyle. So, you know, while I don't do any, you know, specific meditation or anything that each day, it's kind of just been more for me just a kind of progression where, yeah, you know, there's probably times where I'll check in with myself, you know, in the morning and kind of, you know, in my mind go through the best possible way to go through it. But it's more just kind of been a training for me just to kind of, you know, it's it's altered kind of how I think about it and um, just kind of having to change how I approach, you know, a day-to-day -day life and schedule and kind of go with the flow more and be okay with that. And when you said you're imagining the best way forward or, or the best way, is, are you like visualizing like the outcome that you want throughout the day? Yeah, probably, you know, and just, but, all, you know, managing expectations and like, you know, setting yourself up to succeed you know like i always say work hard play hard like we really you know we love to have fun and we love to enjoy everything but you know we also you know during the day it's a grind it's we're working like crazy we're setting up we're sound checking we're having set list meetings and then after the show we're able to have that release so it's just it's just managing kind of the work and the play the song avalanche real quick So we, we did kind of touch on this a little bit, but but you're syncing up at times and then you like lay that foundation at other times. And I'm just curious, you know, how you go about thinking maybe in the moment when you're playing music, um, how do you transition or, or push the energy forward and, and stay on top of it, but at the same time without being like that drummer that you mentioned who, you know, just did the solos and, <laughs> you know, I've yeah. seen, I've seen a show similar to that. Uh, yeah. So, you know, how do you lay the foundation yet lead and not over lead? Yeah, no, that's a good question. It kind of ties in a little bit to when we were breaking down Havana, but just, this is kind of a different um, style and kind of vibe. So it's a different approach a little bit. Um, and it's actually even good to compare those songs because you know, the tempo really, you know, you'll hear the two songs and they're, they're very different and the, the whole vibe and energy is very different, but they're both, you know, they're both instrumentals, they're similar tempo and they both kind of have rhythm wise, kind of that people say four on the floor, which is kind of that do, 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 you know, kind of just punt pushing forward kind of motion. And, you know, they both have that bass rhythm. And that comes with a lot of, you know, the, the, the kick and, and the snare. But then on top of that, it's kind of creating more unique parts within that, you know, like the hi-hat work and what I'm doing with the hands. We talked earlier with Havana how I kind of create that more kind of short note and then lead to kind of more of a release on the ride. 
you know, it's a, it's a, an avalanche. There's, you know, it's a very progression. You know, the song goes in progression and then eventually just goes really higher in energy. So it's, it's similar to that kind of creating that rhythm story where I'll start, you know, like how I mentioned in Havana, I'll start with more of kind of a short note hi-hat thing and as different guitar licks and melodies come in you know I may match them a little bit with the hands and stuff but I'm always keeping that that bass do 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 you know going so it's just meeting different parts of the percussion you know you have that bass driving rhythm and then you're using your hands to kind of create more unique sparkles within that so You'll hear different times. Another song that I uh, you could recommend listening to is it's a similar vibe. It's a song called Offshoot, where when I first start, you know, it's a very simple, and then when the guitar rhythm comes in with like this triplet, like all with my hands while keeping that same rhythm that rhythm going, I'll kind of match that a little bit, and you kind of emphasizes that guitar line and there's just a lot of that with avalanche um and then you know as the song progresses it'll break down to the jam and as it builds you can you can hear us drop into like a big kind of halftime peak section so that song is a lot of you know tension release tension release and then one big moment of tension created by the release and then if you hear it it kind of the outro is kind of in a similar way of kind of how it started. So, yeah, like stepping back, gra you know, like we were saying earlier, graphically picturing the song, you know, it's a lot of like, all right, build up, we're here. And you, know, my, you might think this is the high energy point, you know, then we bring it back down, build it back up to there a little more and you're like, okay. And then once the jam kind of brings it, then, then you're really getting the, the, you know the climax moment so yeah yeah you're kind of teasing the the fake peak and right. then you get to it do you think that your architecture background uh and has any bearing on the way you produce or the way you arrange you know i would i would think it's all tied in you know analytically and intellectually you know, i might not approach it the same way where i write out parts you know like you know, I, I, it's, I still do them in a very feel-oriented way, but, you know, it, I think there could definitely be some correlation there. It's just kind of, you know, creatively, efficiently, I don't know, developing different ways to do things. I, I, haven't, I haven't used a, maybe a physical direct uh, way, but um, it's more probably just in the mind, that kind of like analytical sense of what, what, you know, what would be more efficient and what would work. So, I don't know. For it's sure. a good question. Maybe instinctively, you know, just going on up there. Yeah, yeah. I, well, it's you can't separate the person from the music, so that's why I, yeah. I appreciate you being here and and helping me understand and helping others meet you. Oh, for sure. So, I'm happy to do it. So I want to uh, circle back on all your links and make sure that if anybody listening wants to learn more about you or the band, they can find you uh, in the best place possible. So yeah. you guys are all over the place, but... Any particular links that you want to share? Um, I mean, our Facebook, Pigeons Playing, Ping Pong. You know, our Instagram, Pigeons Playing. Uh, we have our own website um, that we keep, you know, basic stuff. Sorry. Basic stuff, nothing new. We, we keep all our social media. Um, we're on Nugs. A lot of our Nugs is a um, company that puts out a lot. A lot of our live music is on Nugs um, as well as Spotify. So, you know... Keep your ear out for, we're always pushing out new music and new dates and uh, we're very excited to get back on the road and we're working on a lot of new stuff for, for people to hear. So, And I think those people out there, who, if they ha don't know you, they should definitely check out some of your live music because you guys uh, take it to other levels um, in, the, in the live experience. It's high energy. Definitely, uh, it's a, an experience to be had, so don't miss them if you get the opportunity. Is there yeah, anything thanks. else? Shout out to Manny Newman, too, our lighting guy. We, we, we take pride, a uh, large part of our show is, is kind of our visual production, and um, he's so into it. And, you know, he's back at front of house looking like the fifth member of the band playing. So it's, yeah, if you get a chance to see us live, you know, 
we hope you listen to the recordings and love it, but, you know, seeing us live, we like to produce a whole, try to at least produce a whole next level production. So Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's definitely there. So is there anything else that you would like to share uh, with listeners or parting words? It's kind of a strange, obviously a strange time for music. And, you know, normally we're kind of always experiencing new kind of up and coming things out of nowhere on the road. And it's been a very different approach for us to kind of take a step back. And, you know, we're just enjoying life and, you know, people have been going through a lot of tough stuff with this. And, you know, we're just staying positive and trying to be efficient. And we just kind of keep keep pushing forward we can't wait to get back out on the road and yeah well alex aka gator thank you so much for your time today i I really appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing some of your wisdom thoughts and uh, uh, talking about your story so it's always good to meet and understand the people behind the music so thank you for your time yeah i appreciate it man i'm really happy to be here and thank you for doing what you do Listening to the Frio Music Podcast with Michael Morahan. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. And don't forget to share this podcast everywhere. Thanks for listening, and until next time, stay tuned. You are listening to Frio Music. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned.